Hello, my friends, and welcome to our second podcast for Limitless Outdoors. Again, uh, we're going to be going over, uh, as we go through these podcasts, we're going to be going over ways, tips, tactics, how you can live a more abundant life with the Lord and the life that he has intended for you, as well as enjoying his limitless outdoors uh, and getting out there. So we're going to be talking about hunting. We're going to be talking about God. Overall, our goal is that your life would be fuller and richer and enhanced as you listen to what we have to talk about. And today I have my dear friend Adam Talmadge with me. Uh, He lives about 60 miles from where I live. Um, over in Montana. So I'm in Idaho. He's in Montana. Uh, Adam just turned 24, right? Yep. And um, he joined the team a couple of years ago, met my good friend Shane, who I'm hoping to have on here pretty soon. And uh, he has been just a tremendous asset. He brings a lot to the table. Uh, He has just a wealth of hunting knowledge for a guy as young as he is, because I didn't when I was your age. Um, I didn't grow up with some of the mentors that you had. But today I just want to uh, go through and just hear about where Adam came from, kind of his upbringing, what he does for a living. Uh, and we're going to be talking about some cool hunting stories uh, as well and some just big experiences and lessons you've learned uh, in your walk with the Lord as you've gone. So Adam, thank you for joining me today. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So when you were young, you grew up in Troy, Montana, which is a little town. Yep. Um, and that is a, that's a great place to grow up if you're into the outdoors and you grew up in a hunting family. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, what your family did for a living during that time and kind of what it was, what was it like growing up? Were you outdoors all the time? Oh yeah, all the time. Uh, We grew up out on Bull Lake, um, summertime, out swimming, out in the woods. Uh, My grandpa and my dad were logging together and my grandpa is, was a great elk hunter. I mean, one of the best around Troy and my dad grew up in that and then he really grabbed a hold of elk hunting and and you know deer hunting back then was whitetail hunting okay you didn't hunt mule deer why not mule deer are stinky okay gotcha (laughs) you can't eat a mule deer's horns so the passion for mule deer hunting was never really there so they hunted whitetail and elk so when I grew up I mean I couldn't hunt till I was 12, Yeah. but my brother started hunting when he was 12. I was 10, two years apart. I'd go hunting with them when I was about 10 years old. I'd go out with my dad, uh, with my brother. And so I'd get out as much as I could. And I just couldn't wait till I was 12 and I could hunt. So when, when I was finally, I turned 12 and I could hunt, I was just, I, I just grabbed a hold of that, you know? And You know, when I was probably eight years old, got my first 22. Okay. And I was out every day hunting squirrels, hunting birds, whatever, just like your boys. Yeah. And yeah, Troy was a great place for that small town, got the mountains. uh, You could just go out in the woods and do whatever you wanted. And there was nobody around. Now, did your grandpa take you out any? Because so Adam's grandpa is like a legendary hunter around Troy and like the bulls your grandpa has killed are just flat out impressive and the stuff like your great grandpa used to throw away oh yeah antlers weren't what they are today like nobody cared about antlers it was all about story about didn't he kill like a massive white tail and a massive mule deer in the same logging strip in one day yeah he was he was sawing on a logging strip my and somewhere it was around it was right in troy and he it was hunting season he brought his 30 30 and if i'm remembering correctly i think the the whitetail showed up first on his strip giant glazed over just ruddy whitetail buck so he goes and grabs his 30 30 and he shoots this buck he gets it and goes back to sawn i mean it was early in the morning so he's sawing around and all of a sudden this big mule deer buck comes walking down the strip and he did not shoot mule deer i mean they were the plague i mean you did not touch a mule deer waste of time yeah and so this big mule deer buck comes along and it was obviously big enough he was like oh i better shoot that so i could bring it home and show everybody so he shoots it guts it 
goes back to saw and so he comes back home that night he's got these two big bucks and my grandpa was he was i don't know probably four or five he's pretty he's young in his 70s now yeah yeah he's in mid 70s now he's probably four or five and he just said he just remembers trying to count the points of the mule deer and he would start counting on one side and lose count and have to restart he said there were so many points he could not count them as a young boy and so then after they got done looking at him my grandpa or my great grandpa goes down and he throws them in the dumpster throws the head in the dumpster because i mean oh that's cool but can't eat them so you grew up though going over to your grandpa's house hearing these stories obviously your dad was a hunter he's yeah. a hunter too yep and like your grandpa's house is awesome it's loaded with all sorts of oh, yeah. impressive animals so was there do you even remember a time was there a time that you decided like i really want to be a, a hunter i really want to be a big game hunter or was that just something that was just ingrained in you since you were before you can remember i think it was just ingrained in me i mean i was just i was born into it and i mean I guess it was, I was born into it, but then as I started doing it, I realized how much of a passion it was of mine. And I just kind of ran with it. And then that's kind of been the only thing I've wanted to do, is just hunt. And I've always thought if I could just hunt for a living, I'd be happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you never get tired of being out there. No. Really. I mean, obviously, uh, you have a wife and one baby out and one baby one, on the way yep um and so there's a little bit of time you got to be home but yeah and that, i mean that has changed because before i mean i hunted from 12 years old up until got married when i was 21 and i didn't have a family before now you know yeah and so i could just go out and hunt all i wanted and now it's different you got to be home you got to make time for your family and a little bit and that's that's okay are. it's interesting though like how crazy different it is not just troy bonner's ferry and really everywhere like i got shane that book the biggest idaho's biggest mule deers mule deers mule deer <laughs> and um just the incredible stuff that was killed back in the 50s and 60s and like now you just don't even see those genetics no. or deer running around anymore but i want to um I kind of want to press forward a little bit. So you grew up hunting. Um, your family, though, they were all loggers. You, your great grandpa was a logger. Yep. Your grandpa was a logger. Your dad was a logger. You went into after high school, or were you were you logging with him before you got out of high school? How did that work? Uh, no. So I was always around logging. I mean, we'd go up there every chance I got. I'd go up for a day or two and watch them. But right out of high school, I actually worked for the Forest Service fighting oh, really? fires. Yeah okay for two seasons oh fires yep okay and I, actually my second season at the forest service uh that that second winter i went and i saw with my dad for a little bit and not full time just every once in a while but my third year out of high school i started running skitter okay for my grandpa gotcha and i ran that i ran skitter for like two and a half years okay so then I kind of want to press into a little bit when you were, you've shared a story with me a couple of times and I think it's, I think it's a really powerful story. Um, your grandpa and grandma were part of starting the church that you're actually at now. Um, and so faith has always been a part of your family, yeah. your mom and dad, uh, I know have been heavily involved. Um, you are faithfully involved in church, but there was a, there was a Sunday cause hunting has always been a passion, right? Yeah. Uh, but there was a Sunday when you wanted to go hunting. I'll never forget this story cause it's awesome. Mm -hmm. There's a hunt Sunday that you wanted to go hunting. Um, how did that all happen? Because you ended up not going hunting. You ended up going to church instead, but yeah. could you just like share how that day went? Yeah. So it was actually, I think it was 14, um, my third hunting season and it was the second day so opening day was saturday sunday was the second day so it's opening weekend you gotta go hunting yeah i mean it's a big deal we always i always skip school i mean my senior year when because my, my parents had gotten divorced in my senior year i 
like I think I had 30 or 40 missed days of school. Like they barely let me graduate. I had to do all oh, sorts geez. of stuff because I just skipped school <laughs> and went, went hunting. So, yeah. 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 So I mean, second day we wake up. I mean, Saturday night, we didn't kill anything Saturday. Saturday night, I'm expecting we're going hunting tomorrow. So I wake up and my dad's like, we're not going hunting. We're going to church. And I was mad. Instantly, I was mad. And I was, I couldn't drive then. I was 14. So I was kind of, I kind of had to do what they wanted to do. And I mean, we, we went to church every Sunday. It was a normal thing. It wasn't like, oh, I've never been to church before, but we're going to do okay, that. So it just wasn't on. like a wild hair that your dad had. No, I mean, it was just, all of a sudden. it was just, we're going to go to church today. So I go to church and I was, I was mad. Didn't want to be there. And we sang a couple worship songs and I think maybe the second or third song, my great grandpa on my grandma's side, uh, was the interim pastor at the time. Okay. And he stops the song and goes up in the front and he's sobbing and we're all like, uh, okay. <laughs> and he's just sobbing and he, he tells everybody, I feel like somebody doesn't want to be here. And I had not talked to him. I hadn't said a word to anybody, but I was mad. And, uh, and he said, I, I feel like somebody doesn't want to be here. And just tears running down his face. And I just, it was like getting hit in the head with a two by four. I was like, that's me. Wow. Like, I, I know I don't want to be here. And so I, I can't hardly remember how the rest of the service went, but but that afternoon we get home, it's just a bluebird, sunny day, no snow, kind of a weird, uh, last week of October and, uh, kind of warm. We get home and my brother, two years older, he's 16. He can drive. We had a car. We looked at each other and we said, let's go hunting. We'll go deer hunting at, at least today. And we asked my dad if he wanted to go and he's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to stay home today. But you know, you guys should go check out this one road up this drainage it's a gated road just park there and walk up there he's like i've hunted What's it a couple times number? uh <laughs> you know. um everybody in troy knows about it but yeah. uh he said go up there and walk up that road and you might run into a whitetail okay and you know those first couple of years that i started hunting i wasn't i didn't have the passion for mule deer hunting yet i don't i hadn't even killed a mule deer yet i didn't either until i was older yep so whitetail hunting I'm like, okay i mean i'm just going hunting i don't care what i'm doing so we go we park at this gate we go walking up and we i don't know we got maybe a quarter mile up the road and it's kind of muddy in the road and there's fresh elk tracks right in the mud and i was knowledgeable enough to look at elk tracks and decipher cow from bull tracks at okay, that point that's pretty advanced at 14. so i've <laughs> I knew some stuff by then. So I looked at these tracks and I was like, there's a, there's gotta be a bull in there. There's a bull track there. Not a real big one, but there's a bull track in there. And they, they went up the road and then they cut up into the slogging unit up the bank. And I looked at my brother and I said, I'm going to follow those elk tracks. And he's like, I'm just going to keep going up the road and see if I run into them up there, if they cut back. So I just take off up the hill after these elk and it's kind of hard to track them just in the dirt in a logging unit, but I could, I could kind of see where they were going and I was following them up. I get like unless halfway you're up. Unless you're Shane Fouch. Unless you're Shane, okay. he can track anything. <laughs> so I start heading up and I get about halfway up and I just look up and I see this big, dark, swooping thing. And it ended up being the neck of an elk. It was just this dark neck, 150 yards. And it's pretty steep. It was, it was up there a ways. And so I immediately just dropped prone on my belly because that was because it was kind of up through the tree. So I had to get down to, to see him. So I dropped to my belly and I just had my 30 out six with a four power fixed scope, Leopold scope, drop down, throw my gun up. And then at this point, the elk turned and it's standing there staring right down at me straight on. And I look and I can see that it had antlers, but they kind of went straight up and in my head, I'm thinking, oh, it kind of looks like a spike. But right then, I have the crosshairs on him, 
he turns to take off. And right as he turns, I just caught a glimpse of another point and I pulled the trigger. I had the crossers right on, pulled the trigger and he, he runs up like 10 feet and just piles over. <sighs> and I, oh my gosh, I hadn't even, <laughs> I had killed a cow before that, maybe a year or two before that, but I hadn't never killed a bull. Okay. That was the first real big game experience. Right and there what was me. he? So I go up there and my brother was just around the corner and he heard the shot. So he comes over. I go up there and he's a, he's a five by six. Oh, okay. Because in Montana, sticker. for those that haven't hunted Montana, you can't kill a spike bull. That's why he was yeah. hesitating. He was just a raghorn, but he had a little extra point on one of his brow tines. So he was six point. So he was barely over 350 then. Yeah. Barely over, one, barely over 150. <laughs> <laughs> but I was all, I was excited all the same. So that day, I didn't realize it until a little while later, actually. Because in the moment, I was still I was still mad I had to go to church. But then it was all okay because I killed this bull. Yeah. And we show up at the house, I don't know, an hour and a half later. And we're, I walk in the house. My dad's like, what are you doing back already? It's still daylight. I was like, I killed a bull. He's like, what? No, you didn't. I pulled out the brass, said I killed a bull. And we didn't take pictures or nothing. I didn't, I don't, don't even think I had a phone. Yeah. So I couldn't show him a picture, but I was like, I, here's the brass. I killed a bull. Oh my gosh. So we go up there and I think that we waited till the next day because we had gutted it and got it all taken care of. I think the next day we went up there to just spend the day and take the day to get him out. And it had snowed overnight, so we go up there. The whole family goes up, and we game carted him out. But I didn't realize until I think a couple years later what that day actually meant. And I was so passionate about hunting, it just clouded my vision for everything else, the Lord, everything. And what he taught me that day was, if you put him first, everything else will come. Probably easier than if you try to force it. And so putting him above everything, even your strongest passion, like he should be your passion. And yeah. he gave me the passion for hunting. And so I owe it to him to dedicate more time and be obedient and to follow him first that's cool and it's it's really cool because he showed me that and then i got to be a part of limitless outdoors and use my passion my greatest passion for him well it's kind of fascinating right so every time you've told me that story i just think about all the little decisions along the way like I have known so many people that have tried to become hunters and do that for a living um, in their own power, and it's hard. It's a there's a limited pool of money. You got to have a lot of money really to to do these things, um, unless the Lord makes a way. And like obviously for Limitless Outdoors, we're all about the gospel. And so had you not had God first in your life, that wouldn't have even been an option for you to be a no. part of the team because that's what we're all about right and yeah. so like these little decisions along the way but i think one of the cool things to me is and i learned this lesson a long time ago too the same one that you did is putting god first like being honest there's i've killed a lot of animals on sundays even after being a christian like we're hunting somewhere we go to alaska or colorado or wherever i mean we're hunting seven days a week yeah um but that being said when i'm home I can think of maybe one or two Sundays in the last 10 years that I've missed uh, being in church personally and prioritizing it. it. And I know a lot of guys that struggle with that big time. Um, work schedules are real and the limited time off that you get, um, that's real. But I think it's bigger than just, it's, we're not, I don't think, and I, when you're talking about it, I don't think we're talking about just like that that off Sunday where it's hunting season and it's just like, Oh, I have to go to church every single Sunday. It's the, like the tone of your life, the trajectory of your life is God first. Are you in church? And one of the big things for me is, man, I have been seriously hurt, um, in churches. And I know a lot of people that have, and they walk away, like things just happen. There's disagreements. Pastor says something that you don't like from the pulpit or, 
you know, whatever it is, maybe somebody rips you off that's in the church. Uh, it's easy to just kick that to the side. But I think of Hebrews chapter 10, it says that we shouldn't forsake the gathering of the saints, right? And um, church is so important. You know, Ephesians chapter five talks about Jesus, how he gave himself, he died for his church. And so for me, whatever I feel about the church is irrelevant compared to what Jesus feels about the church. And with its flaws and everything else, it's still a priority so much for Jesus that he actually died for the church. And so that's a, to me, that communicates that there's an importance. Like, obviously, there's not some kind of mandate that you have to be in church every single Sunday. That's, that's ridiculous. But um, this, this heart that wants to put God first and go and worship God. And if that conflicts with hunting season, um, man, we have choices to make. But it's cool to see through your life that faithfulness, like where you started to learn when I put God first, uh, when he's priority in my life, like he, he directs the rest of the, the show and he blesses so much when, when we're walking with him, just like a, just like a dad would or anybody else. Like when you're, when you're a good son and you're in a loving relationship with your dad, like he wants to go out of his way and do things. And we see that. So what would your challenge be to guys that maybe just don't feel like they have enough time for church or they feel like their church is in the mountains or anything like that. Do you have a challenge for those guys or even just some input, not even a challenge, just some input from your life? I would say give it a try. Just just go to church and just see what happens because like me, I didn't, that probably wouldn't have happened for me that I would have not killed that elk. We would, I would have gone and done something else. You never know. You never know what the Lord is going to do for you. And you can't even imagine what he's going to do. If you just make that decision to, to put him first. I mean, and like you said, you don't, you don't have to go to church every Sunday to be a good Christian and to do it right i mean there's i don't think that's that's the right way i don't know what the right way is (laughs) yeah i know what you mean but i don't know just and i think for a lot of people too thinking they're like a hardcore hunter it's a pride thing like if you're not out there hunting every day and grinding it out if you take a day off and go to church like you are, what kind of hunter are you? You're not hunting on the weekend, especially for the working man. It's hard. Yeah. Like if you're working five days a week, you got two days a week to hunt. And if you take a Sunday off, you got one day a week. Yeah. That's a big deal. And just to think, I, well, how am I ever going to fill my tags for one day a week? And there's in Montana, there's five weeks of the season. That's five days I get to hunt. That's wild. It's hard. It? It's a hard decision to make, but it is worth it. That's cool. And it's been worth it for me. Cause even after that, I, I probably, I hunted some Sundays, but for the most part, I made it a point to go to church. And if I, I would, I didn't feel that pressure to have to go hunting. I would go to church. And well, I think it's something that you said, like we can't imagine what God can do when we think about things in our own power. And we're thinking about how, like if I only have one day and there's, I only get five days during a season, how am I possibly going to make this happen? Right. Uh, but you know, from the beginning to the end of the Bible, it's God showing off and what he can do that we can't even anticipate, expect, or imagine, or think is even possible. Like I think of Joshua and how, uh, he didn't have, Joshua didn't have enough time. So God actually made the sun stand still in the sky. And you and I both seen that in our lives. Like as we're serving the Lord, we're on these hunts and I'm just like, you've we talked about this before i'm just like lord are we gonna make a video or what because now we're like we're way into this hunt we've spent all this money to be here and we thought like this is where the lord has us and how is it going to happen and all of a sudden on that last day you walk over a ridge and bam there's an elk but the the whole (laughs) it's crazy yes it's happened yeah (laughs) but it makes me think of um it actually makes me think of ephesians chapter uh ephesians chapter three The Apostle Paul says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. 
And I just love that to him who's able to do exceedingly above abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power. That's the Holy Spirit that works in us. Like he can do so much more. And you're thinking, I don't know if I can kill an elk in five days. It's not about what you bring to the table when we're serving the Lord and putting him first. It's about what God, the elk are all his. Yeah. And if he wants to give you an elk and you're putting in the diligence, obviously, and the hard work, it's going to happen. Yep. And so that's a radical. I like what you said about that. Like we can't even imagine what God has for us. Yeah. Yep. And for every, like I, I couldn't have even imagined where I am now because yeah. of it, because of that decision that I made. Like I didn't know I'd be right here right now doing this. Well, let's talk a little bit about, so first thing I want to talk about is how you ended up getting on the team. Um, and then what your year looks like right now, what you do work and limitless and everything. So um, my friend Shane, who he and I started Limitless Outdoors uh, together, just God brought him into my life at a really special time, ended up being the one who got to baptize him. Um, He taught me how to goose hunt, like just an incredible relationship. Well, then Shane pulls some kind of silly move and decides to move from Idaho over to Troy, Montana, which just doesn't make any sense to a guy like me, but he does it right. Cause he couldn't find a house that was actually affordable here. And Troy was still affordable at the time. Um, he goes there, he goes to church again, a church thing. That's kind of fascinating. Yep. Just talking about this. He starts going to the church that you attend and you guys meet. So could you like, could you, how did that even happen? Yeah. So I've been going to the same church my whole life and it was, a, I think it was in July. So it's summertime, about right, like now. And I, we're, I go to church and my dad comes up to me and he says, hey, you see that guy over there? And I look over and I see this guy with this big, long beard and long hair. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. It's like, that guy's part of Limitless Outdoors. And I'd, I'd actually known about Limitless for a while. I've, I'd watched your videos. I'd actually met you. Yeah. At the Bighorn Sportsman Show in Spokane. When you were... When I was little. You were young. I mean, I was... That was the first time I ever met you. Yeah. So we had met. It was kind of weird. Yeah. How this all happens, but... um, Yeah, so I look over, I see this guy. And I notice he's wearing a, a jacket that has a logo. It says Limitless Outdoors on it. I was like, oh, he must be the real deal. And, you know, when I thought of Limitless Outdoors, I thought of Justin, because you're, you're like the main guy. And... I was like, yeah, I think I've seen that guy before, but I don't remember his name. So I go over there and introduce myself and it's Shane Fouch. And so we get to talking about hunting and all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, we're getting ready to go to Alaska end of August. And oh, cool. And so we end up exchanging phone numbers. And I think I saw him maybe one more time before you guys ended up going to Alaska, but so you guys go to Alaska, you're gone for two weeks. You get back and I immediately, I knew when you're going to be back, I immediately shoot him a text. How, how'd you guys do? I want to know all about it. And so he, he had killed that really nice moose. Oh, his, yeah. his best one. One of the best ones ever, ever. Golly. And, uh, so he gets back and so we make a date to, go over and have dinner with his family. We hadn't really, I hadn't really met his family yet. I just talked to him. And, uh, so we go over and have dinner with them and just met him. And in the back of my head, the whole time after I met Shane, I'm just thinking, how, how do I get to be a part of limitless outdoors? Cause that's, I mean, that's it. That's a dream right yeah. there for me. And just to get to travel around and hunt all over the place. Because all I, I've only hunted here. I've only hunted in, in Troy, Montana. Never hunted anywhere else. So I was like, oh man, that'd be just amazing. So I asked Shane, how can I be a part of the team? And he just kind of laughs. And I'm like, no, I'm serious. And he's like, well, I think first of all, you need to meet Justin. <laughs> So we need to have a, a lunch date and meet Justin. Well, that didn't, I think he probably had talked to you about me. Yeah. Or just briefly. And I think it was, it was actually Halloween. 
you guys were doing the the fall festival at church over here in Bonners and we came over and I met you there and I won't say the first thing you said to me, but the second thing you said to me, (laughs) (laughs) the second thing you said to me was, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, well, I'm leaving for a, I was going on a cow elk hunt and, uh, it's like, oh, you, you want to go with me and Shane to the salmon? You go on a deer hunt. And I said, oh, man, if I hadn't already made plans, oh, I would. Man. And I I really felt after you guys got back from that and the success you had, I felt really bad for not going. But that was the, the first time I met you. And then that's, that first season, knowing you guys, and you kind of just said, all right, just film film your hunts and we'll see just my hunts and at home. So I started hunting with Shane. Yeah. And we hunted for like two days and I killed a pretty decent mule deer buck, got on a video and I saw, Oh man, I'm in. That's (laughs) awesome. (laughs) But uh, yeah, that was really the first, that was how I, how I met you guys. And I was so from my side, I don't, I don't know how much you and I've ever actually talked about this much, but Shane was telling me a lot about you and Okay, so I got to back up a little bit. So when I was a kid, I loved the Primos hunting shows. So unlike you, my family really wasn't hunters. Yep. Um, my dad killed like a little three-point whitetail once. and like So I didn't have that, and so I would watch these shows. But uh, Will Primos was great, but there was this other guy on the Primos shows that I really liked, and his name was Brad Ferris. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Brad was just like, man, that guy was a killer from Manila, and he's always sticking these big bulls. And but something I really loved about Will Primos, and I've never sat down and talked to him or anything before, but I know, uh, I know he's a Christian man, and you could see the discipleship with the team that he had. Um, and it wasn't all about Will Primos; he wanted to raise up younger guys. And so for a long time, and I know Shane feels the same about this. Like I've always been looking for my Brad Ferris in a sense, like you don't have to run with that too far, but like, that's what I'm looking, I'm looking for. I've always been looking for that guy. And, um, I knew of you and I'd heard lots about your family. And then Shane says he's hanging out with you. And Shane is just talking super highly of you all the time. Um, totally unwarranted by the way. Yeah. But yeah, now we're stuck with you. And, um, (laughs) but no, he's talking about you and I met you that Halloween and I remember when I met you, like strong handshake, obviously God built him to be a backcountry hunter. I mean, what are you? Six, six, two. Yeah. Solid six, two, just lean, mean, no quirks with the body. Like it just all works well. And, um, just super passionate and genuine and a solid Christian. And I was like, man, this is the perfect fit, but I'm trying to be a little temperate, but I wanted you to come with us on that hunt for sure to get to know you some, um, but yeah, and so I, I'd been, you know, ever since Shane told me about you, I was like, man, I want to, I want to see if we can get him involved and bring him on. And so then you, you kind of slowly start getting involved. What happened? So that was the first year. You think you're a stud because you kill a little three by four mule deer, and yep. then, <laughs> yep. And then what happened the next year? So the next season was, I guess, the first full season for me with you guys. And it started off really good because uh, Shane and I just hunted at home. And we just, during archery season, we just, you you and uh, Colton had gone to Alaska and you just said, I want you to kill an archery bull and I, I don't want it any farther than five yards. <laughs> <laughs> so the bar was set high and, you know, the mountains here at home are hmm. just... I don't know. There, there's nothing really like them. We've hunted all over the place since then, but when you're in the mountains here, there, it's like a full picture of what God can actually do and the beauty of his creation. Like that is a, that's a really good example when that's you're cool. in the heart of it. And so Shane and I, actually, we spent 21 days in the heart of, of the mountains there and we saw some incredible things we got we got some footage of big 
320, 330 bulls, which that's, I mean, that's good for here. Yeah. That's really good for here. Anything over 300. Bears, goats. Uh, I say bears, grizzly bears, lots of grizzly bears. Okay. Um, just a lot of footage. And I didn't end up actually harvesting an elk. And we thought, man, we failed. But the amount of footage we got and the quality was actually, I think, better than actually harvesting an well, our, animal. One of our top videos came out of that fall when those five the bears Grizzlies. came running right at you guys. Like, yeah. That was an intense situation, and those things are running right at you. And that is, I, I don't even remember what that's at. It's at a couple million yeah. views, I think. Something like that. Now, it's between a million and two million or even more now. It's hard to keep yeah. track of it. It's... It really blew up and the gospel went forward huge because of that. And it's funny how sometimes we think something's a failure, but God is actually crafting, like he crafted one of our best videos out of what you thought was going to be a failure of a hunt. Yeah, it's amazing. And then after that, I think uh, it was just an action-packed season. We went to Colorado. Went to Colorado, killed my, fir- or my, my biggest bull to date. And that was just opening morning crazy um couldn't have even imagined that <laughs> that was heaven i mean the night before we had glassed a lot of bulls and i'd kind of picked this one out already and we were like oh let's go after him but you don't ever think it's going to work out perfectly and, and then it does and it's like how yeah how did this actually work out and you just know in most of the or all of our hunts that are the were successful and we're like how and you just know the Lord's hand is in, in it all. And that's the only reason. He's the only reason we're out there doing it. We're doing it for him. And he is, he's making these videos. He already knows what's going to happen. And, and we have no idea. Yeah. And that's, again, just putting him first, though. Like, yeah. So we talk about it all the time as a team. But like, the reality is, is we're not hunting I don't think any of us feel like we're hunting for ourselves. We literally, you think about some of the animals that we haven't shot because they're not on video. Yep. And like our commitment is to make those videos. Cause we like, I believe, and I know you believe like we're there to serve God. And then he just shows up. Like he oh, makes yeah. videos when I don't even think he's going to like, it, there's just no way, there's no way that we should be successful. Yeah. And all of a sudden we are down to the wire. Yeah. But that's a, I mean, and we've talked about that too is, Sure, I've had some opening day success since, and and the video you feel like you haven't gotten enough footage for a video. Yeah. But then there are some where I mean, you'll go days and days and days, and you're compiling all this footage, and then you you end up harvesting something right at the end, and it just makes this incredible video. When you think you got all this footage for nothing because you're not going to fill the tag, and nobody's going to watch that because you didn't fill the tag. Yeah. And then right at the last second. He yeah. puts an elk in front of you. It's crazy. And you just know it's not anything you did. That's cool. Let's fast forward a little bit here. Kind of, or we're just kind of working around this. So you've always wanted to dream. You dreamed of hunting full time. Um, you kind of do that. But like right now, could you just share what your work schedule looks like? So this year you're going to be working for Limitless for four months of the year. Yep. Um, and then the rest of the year, how do you, how do you get by? Are you a trust fund kid? Do you have lots of money? Oh yeah. Lots of money in the bank, are you independently <laughs> wealthy criminal. <laughs> what are you, what do you do? No. So actually, so hunt for limitless, uh, four months and then a couple months in the winter, uh, we're chasing cats and I start work at the forest service, uh, in March. And I clear trails for the Forest Service until September. And it's a great, it's a perfect schedule for me because I get in super good shape. And then I hunt and it nothing really butts heads except spring bear. Oh, yeah. And this year. Yeah, that was frustrating. This year was actually pretty, it was, it was frustrating for me, but, um, but it's okay because of everything else I get to do in the fall. I can't, 
once again, it's not for me, so I can't get too caught up in missing out when they're still, you guys are still out there making videos. Yeah, that was a, that was a hard one. I mean, we had some good stuff this spring and you weren't able to get out there on it, but what, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about though, was like, you could easily, so you're in an interesting position, right? So you don't make a whole lot during the course of a year. Um, you have had people really wanting you to do more, uh, to get a different career or something more stable. Would, what is the reason that you have chosen right now to commit to maybe not making as much as you could, but really serving in limitless outdoors? Why is that? I'm just, I'm trying to be faithful. The Lord put me in this position. I know this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is because I think of it, any other kind of ministry and I don't feel like I would fit and this I fit. Yeah. And so I just have to be faithful that the Lord will take care of us. And he has, it's been actually amazing. And I, I, I just know I can't just go out and get some big job where I'm gone all the time. I have to be available for the fall. And so that's kind of just where I'm at. I just, and my wife is fully in support, which is great because if she wasn't, there'd be issues. And we've been growing, right? I mean, I think of, um, because we became a, we became a nonprofit in 2000 and the end of 2018, 2019 was the first time we had a a donation. Like all of us were volunteer up to that point. Um, we've come to a point now where you and Colton and sometimes Shane, um, are on for part of the year, a couple months a year, we cover your expenses, do a couple thousand dollars a month to cover expenses, but, um, it's moving in, it's moving in a cool direction. So is that exciting to you to see as it's growing, right? There's hope that like it can become full time down the road as the Lord opens the door. Yeah. And that would be amazing to just be able to, and not, not even just hunting all year. Just being able to serve him in this ministry in other ways. I mean, beast feasts and traveling around, spreading the gospel all year would be amazing. Um, And I'm... Well, because the hunting is such a... I know a lot of people, Colton and I kind of talked about this last week, but a lot of people think of the hunting as like, that's all you do is hunt. But man, we don't hunt that much in all reality. No. In the fall, there's quite a bit of hunting going on, but there's still... there's so much other stuff that's going on. I mean, even stuff like this right now, Yeah, recording podcasts, um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in the ministry. It's just, there's a lot more to do than just the hunting. We'd love to see it grow more than that. Yeah, there's always something to do. Yeah. So yeah, it would be, it's exciting to see that it is moving forward and there's there's hope for that. And, but for now I am content with what what I'm doing and the schedule I have and and I'm, I will be available when it becomes full-time. Yeah. So I got to talk about um, the first picture I ever saw of you. Like, this is just like the most awesome picture ever. In fact, I, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you want to go and watch this on YouTube, I'll put the picture on there so you can <laughs> see it. The first picture I ever see of Adam is with, it's actually not, I don't even think you're in the picture actually. Are you? No. No, there's just a buck laying in like nipple deep powder up in these rugged mountains. This big mule deer buck that he killed on just the perfect day. I mean, perfect day. Could How old yeah. were you and could you tell us so, about that story just a little bit? Funny, actually, it was the same year I killed my first bull. Okay. Same season. 14. It's 14. It was two weeks after I had the, I killed that bull and okay, that I didn't Sunday. Know that. That's awesome. Yep. Same season. So two weeks after that, we just start getting tons of snow mid season. And there's this mountain that it's not very tall, but we picked up some mule deer sheds up there. And so my dad and I go up there, look for a mule deer. And I had never killed a mule deer before. And we get up there probably about 4,500 feet. And I mean, the snow is getting deep up there and 
we know and my any hunter that's hunted mule deer know that they will stay up in deep snow like it takes a lot to push them push them down low and it's the rut so we get up there and the snow's starting to get it's over my knees it's powder Hmm. and i look up and there's this huge trail through the powder and we're thinking oh probably mule deer or elk we get up there and it's a bunch of deer tracks like a whole bunch of them going across the side hill here and they go out onto this bench so we followed out onto this bench and i look up and there's a like a five point whitetail buck with some does I'm like what in the heck are you doing up here and they take off and i was like i ain't shooting i want to shoot a mule deer i'm not shooting a whitetail so they take off and so we start going up and we get up top of the ridge and it benches off up there and we're just wallowing through the snow it's getting deep at this point and we get up on this bench and my dad's in front of me and he goes big buck and i look up past him and here like 75 yards here's a bunch of deer and i'm looking and i just see this mash or mule deer he's like out to his ears and i just all i can picture is he's got this sticker like a three or four inch sticker coming out the side and just biggest buck i've ever seen in my life 75 yards and he's just lip curling and oh sniffing gosh. his does and just kind of chasing him around right there it's flat it's in, the deep powder. This, in the deep powder and so i get set up on this little tree and it's cold and uh my dad's like okay just wait for him to stop broadside work we got all the time in the world no hurry so he's you know doing his thing making his rounds and finally he stops there broadside 75 yards i had the crossers right on his chest and kaboom and he crow hops up like he's he's hit and bails off the side of the hill and all the deer scatter and we're like oh my gosh i got him just high-fiving and celebrating and i don't know like a minute goes by and we're, okay let's walk over there and i walk over to where he's standing and there's a ball of hair and no blood and his track goes over the bank no blood and all of a sudden, I look up the hill, and there's this kind of opening going up the hill. And there he is just bouncing up the oh, hill. Yeah. And, you know, a hit mule deer doesn't bounce. No. Or go. <laughs> or go uphill. uphill. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's the same buck because there's a big old sticker coming out the side. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> my heart just sank. And I sit down on my butt as he's bouncing up, and I, I had jacked another shell in. And he's going up, and I'm thinking he's wounded or something. I got to shoot him. So I click misfire click misfire no. misfired two or three times i don't know i had factory ammunition i don't you know why shooting a weather bee. that's what was well, I, weren't, I wasn't shooting <laughs> weather <bee. laughs> no and and he just goes up and out of sight gone and we're both looking at each other and i'm about in tears at this point yeah like the biggest buck that's i've ever seen in my life is gone and you would know you know they're probably not going to see him again. Yeah. Probably not. So we get up there on his track and I'm like, I mean, I still have a little bit of hope. And my dad's like, eh, he's probably gone. And I'm like, let's get on his track. And we follow him up and he goes up to the next bench. And then his tracks with the does dive off the steep north slope. And it's just dark timber, steep alder and down through there. And we can see their tracks going through the powder over the logs and down and gone. And we're standing there. We're both standing there and just it's over and I am just heartbroken. I was standing there for probably a minute or two. All of a sudden I see a doe, her head pop up over a log and she comes back up her track and she's coming right back to me. And I'm thinking, are they all coming back up? Cause that <laughs> buck was still with them. All of a sudden right behind the second or third doe, here comes this buck and he just completely forgot about what had happened. Yeah. And he's walking like right- that stupid one that I killed with you down in, Oh yeah. 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 They, <laughs> just he's like, just completely <laughs> rut crazed, you know, and he, he's coming right back to me. And at this point he's at like 50 yards and still closing the distance and they come up and they kind of cut side hill and they walk out onto the bench and he walks behind this big fir tree. And all I can see is his left side, <sighs> his front fork sticking out from behind the tree and his, his, his front shoulder and head were behind the tree and his whole body was sticking out. And I was like, yep, that's him. 30 yards boom right in the chest and he turns 
and then he stops and he's standing there again and I boom shoot him again and then he runs out around the point of the ridge out into that opening okay and I know I can I mean 30 yards I can see a blood trail in the, in the snow awesome. so we run down there and he he had gone down around the ridge and then he started plowing you know they just start they get low and they just start plowing and he plowed a swath through the powder a big trench out into the middle of the opening and died and that's where that picture came from is i think i my dad's phone he had a little old those flip open phones yeah they take horrible pictures but i was like that is cool that is the coolest i'm glad i took a picture of that because i'm i mean we're looking you see the valley and he's just laying out there he looks like a stinking elk out there that's where that came from and he he is still my best buck okay yeah that's a nice deer i haven't talked to him yet so obviously you've hunted a lot but there's a lot more ahead of you hopefully um i think we'll as we wrap up i want to hear what your favorite animal is to hunt right now and what you would like is there an animal that you haven't hunted that you want to hunt or why don't you talk about those just a little bit yeah so i think ever since that day with my first mule deer buck i got hooked on mule deer and i've always just had a real passion for mule deer elk hunting and we've talked about this also it's like elk hunting is hard and it just seems like you just have this pressure to kill an elk yeah when you're mule deer hunting it's fun and i don't know what it is about it but it's just a there's not as much pressure you're just out there and you're just trying to run into a big buck and i feel if that you, fi- for sure. you know and so and then when you kill them you don't have to like with an easy. elk man you're just like how am i going to get this thing out of here yeah and that's the other thing is like you can kill a mule deer anywhere and one guy can pack a whole deer out yeah we've done it and and uh yeah so i think mule deer i've been there it's my number one and the animal that I haven't hunted yet that is probably my dream hunt is a sheep. A sheep, huh? And, and it's specific, bighorn or doll? A bighorn sheep and not just anywhere, right here at home. Oh, okay. So I've been putting in for this tag for 12 years now okay. and haven't got it. So You want it bad. I want it bad. And I've spent so much time in these mountains that I know what it's going to take and how to hunt them i think and it's i've seen guys over the years that get the tag and waste it yeah or they don't hunt that and it's not so much about killing the animal as the hunt yeah because of the where it is and i don't know it's just going to be a romantic hunt and i'm really looking forward to it and shane has has told me before He's like, you don't want to get it when you're too young. Yeah. Because you won't appreciate it. And so you want to be at a place in your life where you're going to actually appreciate it. Because, and I, even for as young as I am, I think I will appreciate it to its fullest. I think you will. You're much more, you're not uh, bloodthirsty. Like, they say that hunters go through different stages, right, in their life. And there's just like the, I got to kill as, limit out. There's the limit out phase where you just got to kill as much as possible. And then as you mature and grow older, like you get into the processes and just enjoying the whole thing. And I've spent enough time with you in the mountains. Like you can just sit back and relax and take in the moment. And that's really what it's all about. Like you think about the hunts that were amazing. It wasn't because you just killed some monster deer. It's like, it's the ups and the downs, the buck that you miss and, runs up the hill and he's getting away from you and you think all hope is lost. Then he comes back and you hammer him and he dies out on that precipice out there. Like it's just, but like all the time we spend down in Colorado camping in the back country, it's the packing in and yep. all those cool memories, eat Chick-fil-A all the way down. Oh yeah. It's the whole that's process. Yeah, it's so the that's whole the thing. dream, huh? Is the, that's the dream. The sheep. Yeah. That's cool. And hopefully I got a lot of years left in me to, wait for it (laughs) yeah i think you will well i think that we'll wrap it up there and um thanks for thanks for sharing i could talk to you for ever about this like you're one of the best 
hunting storytellers I know. Um, and I just want to, I just want to encourage those of you listening or watching, um, you know, we talked about one of the big things I really wanted to cover today with Adam that we did was talking about putting God first. And I loved Adam's challenge of giving it a try, putting God first and seeing how he orders the rest of it. Uh, you know, the word of God tells us that a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And so just giving your feet to the Lord, allowing him to be him to direct, him to direct, direct your, life, your life, and he can do he can exceedingly, do exceedingly abundantly more than you could even think. Uh, there's another verse that says uh, that eye has not seen and ear has not heard all the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Uh, but for Christians, he goes on to say, uh, he has revealed that by his spirit, like all this amazing stuff. And so uh, if you if you want to know more about Jesus, if you want to press in more, learn to follow him better, make a commitment, go over to our website, www.limitlesshunting.com. Uh, we have a resource that we wrote called The First Mile. Uh, it really walks you through the Bible and answers a ton of questions about who Jesus is, why we need him, how to give our life to him, what it looks like to walk with him, how to study his word, how to find out the purpose that he has for your life, and so many other cool things. And we send that to you absolutely free if you want it. Um, so I encourage you just to go over there and, again, just challenge you to put God first. Uh, prioritize him above everything else and watch what he does in your life. Until next time, my friends, just want to remind you that it doesn't matter what you've done, matters what you do now. Tomorrow does not have to look like yesterday looked. God bless you all, and we'll see you next week.